And the thing that's cool about that is that is what you should be doing, right? When you go out in your peers, you should be not subjugating your individuality to your peers, because that's not exactly right. That's kind of based on an inhibition model. You know, you've got aggression, you've got bad habits, they have to be inhibited. You learn that by interacting with your peers. It's not the right model. Piaget, that's a Freudian model. Piaget was, was correct about that. He basically pointed out that what should happen is, let's say with your aggression, and hopefully you have some, is that it gets socialized. And so you, you learn how to play games, but you don't drop your drive to win. You integrate that in the games. And so you try to win, you try to play hard, but if you're defeated or you hit something negative, you don't respond negatively. And you can keep that all bounded within being a, fair, a, a good player, a fair, a fair player. And that means what's happened is you've learned how to play a game or a set of games that also includes the darker parts of you and they actually become part of your force of character it's way better if you can pull that off it's, and, and that's what you definitely want to do as an adult like all you people are going to have to learn to negotiate on your own behalf and that that's really hard it means that you have to know what you want you have to be able to communicate it and you have to be able to say no and to say no you have to be built on a solid foundation you have to have options so you, you got to remember that as you go through your life is like if you don't have options you can't negotiate with someone and if you're not willing to use them they win period because if you're asking your boss for more money say the answer is no because he doesn't have any spare money lying around that he can just give to you and lots of other people are asking so some of that zero sum stuff you know not all of it because often you cooperate with people and the whole pot can grow but some of it's zero sum and so you better have a case made. It's like, here's why I should, here's how much money I should have, here's why. Here's the benefit to you that will accrue if you don't, if you do it. Here's the consequences that you don't. They're actually real. They will cost you, and I will do them. It's like, then you can negotiate. And you, you don't do that rudely. But those arguments, you better have them in order. Like, so for example, if you're going to negotiate for a raise or a, or a status shift, you better have your resume at hand, all polished up, and know where else you're going to look for a job, and you better be able to get one. Because otherwise you're just, you're weak, and you will not win the negotiation. And if you're too agreeable, so you're conflict avoidant, you will make less money across time, that's already been well established. And that's because you don't have teeth, not enough. And so, in the little micro contests that you're going to have every day, you're going to incrementally lose to people who are more aggressive, who have bigger teeth, and that's what happens. So, so don't let that happen. You want to you place yourself so you can negotiate, because otherwise you're just a facade. And in a real battle, a facade is just torn down right away. So, yes, well, say no more, right? Well, the cricket, he's supposed to be helping the puppet out, but he overslept. It's like, that's just another indication that he's not everything he could be yet. And that's really, ah, that took me a long time to puzzle out with regards to interpreting this movie. I could not figure out, all right, I told you this, if the bug is the person who opens the hero narrative and who can guide the transformations of time and who has the same initials as Jesus Christ, it's like, and is like knighted by nature herself, why is he such an idiot? It's a very difficult thing to figure out, but, but the idea that the conscience isn't omniscient, even though it has that sort of, that voice of, of let's say, common sense, uh, and that fits very nicely in with the Freudian idea of the superego, again, because the superego can be flawed. It can be too harsh, it cannot be, it cannot be properly developed. You see that often with people who are orderly. So they're high in conscientiousness, conscientiousness fragments into industriousness and orderliness. Orderly people like willpower, they're very judgmental, and they like things to be exactly where they're supposed to be, but they're also very self-punitive. So, conservatives are much more likely to be orderly, by the way, it's, it's one of the best predictors of conservative. Low openness is the best predictor, but right after that is high, high orderliness. So, and it's associated with disgust sensitivity, which is really an amazing thing, we'll talk about that later. Anyways, the cricket, well, he falls down his first day on the job. He's not as conscientious a conscious, he's not as conscientious a conscience as he should be. 
So he's feeling pretty stupid. He's got his little millionaire clothes on there, but he's really not living up to them. So he does catch up to uh, the fox and the puppet, however, and tries to dissuade Pinocchio from going down this road. And of course, the cat. Well, you can see what the cat's doing there. He's got a big hammer, big mallet, and he's gonna. He also shows you just exactly how much of a clue he has. He's gonna wallop the bug who's sitting on the fox's hat, which I think he actually does. And you know, then the fox can't get out of his hat and has to talk through his hat, which basically is what he's doing the whole time, anyways. So, this I really like. So you see on the left here, the cricket is is speaking inside this flower, you know. And like I said, there's nothing accidental in these in these representations. So these are artists who are coming up with these compositions, and they, their fantasy has a structure. And so the cricket is speaking out of this flower that has, well, you could think about it as it has a sexualized element. So you could think about that as a phallic part of it, and that part of the feminine part of it. Well, they are flowers after all. They are the sex organs of plants, and so. And that's very much the same over here as this is the yoni and lingam. This is from from uh, from Hindu cultures, and so, and you see, there's a snake wrapped around that, and so that's f masculine and feminine, with the snake wrapped around it, and that's that's a holy representation, you know, a sacred representation, and it represents, it represents the deepest reality. That's one way of thinking about it, like chaos and order, surrounded by the snake. It's the same, exactly the same idea, and so the cricket speaks out of that. Already know that because the cricket is the conscience, and he's been awakened in part by by Geppetto and, and the good father, and awakened in part by the good fairy and nature. And so he speaks with those voices, and and he's also a manifestation of of the underlying chaos itself, because nature and culture spring out of chaos. You know, I already showed you that schematic representation. Okay, so I'll just end, I'll just end this. Scene and then I'll, we'll have like a 15 minute break, okay? So, anyways, the cricket tries to make a case for why Pinocchio shouldn't go off to be a celebrity, but you know, it's a hard case to make because the fox is very manipulative and Pinocchio is naive and it sounds like a good offer. And also, the fox is actually quite forceful, you know, he basically takes him by the hand. So, the temptation is. And this is something else I like about the movie. You can't just say, well, the puppet gets what he deserves, because he's little, naive, and what he's facing is really malevolent, truly malevolent, and physically overpowering. And so the movie does a nice job of not minimizing the threat that's posed by this particular temptation. And that's part of what makes it art. Okay, good. So we'll stop there. We'll have a break for 15 minutes, and then we'll start with the stage. So, all right. So, here we are at the big event, and Pinocchio's off to be a celebrity. And uh, the cricket is watching. And uh, Pinocchio basically, well, he's got some natural talent, because he's, he's a puppet, and he doesn't have strings. And he goes on stage and, with strings, and then he drops his strings, and the whole crowd is amazed. And the crowd should be amazed when that happens, right? You can imagine when a kid goes to school, um, and shows some independence, that that's actually going to... People are going to notice that. His, his peers are going to notice that, the teachers are going to notice that. Maybe it's too much independence even, right? But it's still a... it is a remarkable thing too, like... It, it's so interesting, you know, you can see marked signs of independence in children... well, right from the time they're born, basically, because... what's one of the things that's really funny about infants is that... You know, when they're crying, you always think, oh, the baby's... Well, you're crying, it's, the baby's sad. It's like, no. <laughs> a lot of the time, that baby is angry. And the way that we know that is because you could do facial expression coding on infants, just like on, on adults, and you can tell what emotion they're expressing. And very frequently, like, when the kid starts to recognize his mom explicitly, because he or she knows the smell right away, pretty much, in the sound of the voice, but visually, um, if someone who comes in and it isn't who the baby wants, so generally it isn't mom, the baby will start to cry. But it's not because the baby's sad, generally, it's because it's angry that mom didn't show up. And that's an early sign of will. It's like this kid has, this kid wants things, like, and it's perfectly willing to tell you about that. And of course, a two-year-old who's having a temper tantrum 
is in some sense doing the same thing, it's poorly integrated will and independence, obviously, but it certainly runs contrary to what you want you don't want your two-year-old having a temper tantrum in the middle of the toy store it's extraordinarily embarrassing for you and, well, for you, but it's also embarrassing for the two-year-old this is one of the th reasons I think that that sort of thing should be carefully socialized rapidly, because it's actually humiliating for the kid, because other people don't like that and they're very judgmental about, like they won't say anything usually, but sometimes they will but they're not happy about the fact that that's happening, and they will judge the child negatively and so you don't want your child to be behaving in a way in public that makes other people think badly of them it's, it's, really, it's really not good, and so you, you, part of your job as a parent is to not expose your child to that sort of experience, especially not repeatedly it's really hard on them or they get narcissistic, which is also really hard on them, it's just, it takes a lot longer to manifest itself